Hey there, class. Welcome back. Let's discuss the cluster C disorders, those that are anxious and fearful. We will be discussing uh, avoidant personality, dependent personality, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So for avoidant personality, uh, we are talking about people who are socially inhibited, uh, they feel inadequate, and they are hypersensitive. Remember, with schizoid personality disorder, these are people who are loners and socially inhibited, but uh, they don't really feel anything about other people, and they don't really respond when other people respond to them. With avoidant personality disorder, uh, the people do have a great deal of feelings. They would like to be with people, but uh, they feel so bad about themselves, um, and they're afraid of being found out as being bad, and so they avoid people. Their um, underlying core belief is, if people knew the real me, they would reject me. Here's a story about Irene. Painfully shy all her life, Irene grew up in her sister Susan's shadow. She only expressed herself through writing and couldn't bring herself to talk to students or teachers at school. A teacher accused Irene of turning in Susan's work because she didn't think Irene had it in her to write so well. This caused Irene to withdraw further. After high school, she took a job in a warehouse where she didn't have to interact with others. She avoided any opportunities for advancement so as to avoid rejection and people. Dating was also miserable, as she was so busy watching her date's body language and word choice for signs of rejection that she couldn't even mumble responses to his questions. She became depressed and stopped sleeping, which caused her parents to send her to a psychiatrist who diagnosed avoidant personality disorder. In group therapy, she met Robert, who was worse off than she was. So she was kind to him. They married but he was unloving and abusive. She, as always, swallowed her feelings until one day he broke her ankle and she called 911. So the clinical description of this disorder is that uh, people are avoiding occupational activities that involve significant interpersonal con contact because they are afraid of being criticized or disapproved of or rejected. They also avoid social relationships. They won't get involved with people unless they're certain that they're going to be liked. So with Irene, she has relationships um, with her family because she knows that they will love her. And she gets involved in a relationship with Robert because she sees him as being worse off than she is. And so she thinks that surely he will like her. They show restraint in intimate relationships because of the fear of being shamed or ridiculed. So they won't stand up for themselves. We see that uh, clearly with Irene. She won't stand up. He becomes pretty abusive pretty quickly in the in the marriage, and she won't stand up to him until finally it escalates to um, um, some pretty severe physical abuse. They're preoccupied with being criticized um, or rejected in social situations. Um, so uh, she tries to date, and she can't even get through the date because she's so concerned about what he's thinking about her. Um, they view the self as socially inept, personally unappealing, and totally inferior to others, which is what motivates them to avoid others, even though they badly would like to be with others. And they are unusually reluctant to take personal risks or engage in any new activities that might be embarrassing. So as a child, Irene is not going to try out for the drama club um, or even join something simple like the choir. Um, she's not going to... Uh, um, try to go for any kind of promotion at work because she might embarrass herself. This is really different from social phobia, although it is related. Uh, with social phobia, there is a very, very intense fear um, and uh, a feeling of panic that comes over the person. Um, AVPD is more pervasive. Uh, it's a more generalized manner of interacting with the world. Causes of this, typically um, the kids start out as extremely shy and instead of that getting better as they get older, which is usually the case with shyness, instead it gets worse and they become more and more reclusive and more and more shy. It's not uncommon um, for there to have been uh, childhood emotional abuse, something like two thirds of people with this disorder have had emotional abuse as a child. It's not unusual for them to have a history of trauma. So maybe they witnessed a horrible accident or they were physically or sexually abused themselves. Um, sometimes there's a sensory processing difficulty with um, kids like this, where uh, they, a sensory processing disorder is where you don't process uh, sensory information quite the same way that other people do. Um, uh, uh, the tag on your shirt might feel more scratchy to you than it does to someone else, like a lot scratchier. 
uh, sounds may uh, be sensed as louder than they are to other people. Uh, pitches might uh, be too much. Uh, bright light might be too much. So a person with sensory processing difficulties might end up with AVPD. And then finally, there is probably a history of parental and peer rejection uh, that causes uh, these people to avoid others. And the, per the parents might reject uh, because the child was a very difficult temperament baby. And um, it's, it's easy for even the most loving parent to have some rejecting behaviors toward a difficult baby. And of course, we know that peers will uh, ridicule and reject um, kids that they see as, um, as weird or as extremely inhibited and shy. Treatment for this involves um, interventions for anxiety, interventions for social skills, um, treatment similar to social phobia. The therapeutic alliance is really critical here. This is um, a patient who sees themselves as unworthy. And in order for there to be a, a, a successful relationship between therapist and patient, there has to be what's called a therapeutic alliance. And the therapeutic alliance is, is based on we're in this together. And it's also based on uh, the therapist offering what's called unconditional positive regard to the patient. This is something that comes from Carl Rogers um, and his uh, humanistic theory. He saw um, uh, people who came to him for help, not as patients, but as clients, and they were in it together. And he had unconditional positive regard for them, meaning that he uh, saw them as worthy, valuable people who are worthy of love, no matter what they did. This is something I try to offer to all of my students. I always hope that whether you get an A or an F in the class, whether you turn things in on time or never turn things in, I always see you as a person who is worthy of respect and love and is of ultimate intrinsic value. Um, this is something that is really hard for people with avoidant personality disorder to accept that anybody would see them in that way. So uh, it's, it's a challenge for the therapist. I couldn't figure out um, a Harry Potter or office character who might have avoidant PD. So I'm going with young Elsa. Uh, if you remember the Frozen story, if you've seen the movie, uh, she, Elsa discovers that she has these um, abilities um, that can be harmful. And so she spends her childhood hiding in a room, avoiding others because she's afraid of rejection. She thinks there's something very, very wrong with her. And so she avoids relationships, even with her sister, Anna, who is begging her to come and play with her. She views herself as bad and she hides out until she's grown up and finally comes out. Let's talk a little bit about dependent personality disorder. This is cluster C, again, uh, anxious and fearful. Um, these are people who need to be taken care of. They are submissive and they are clingy. Their core belief is I need people to survive and be happy. Amy was part of a happy group in high school that was excited about applying to college and moving away. Amy pretended to be excited too, but in truth, she was terrified about leaving home and had no idea what she might like to study. When her best friend Dora applied to nearby Christian University in nursing, Amy thought, might as well do that. When they both got accepted, Amy asked to room with her and Dora agreed. So they got all excited about sharing a room and they went shopping together for room decor and clothing. Dora never really noticed that Amy never had her own opinions and bought all the same things she did. All the same clothes, all the same bedding, all the same decor. In college, the other students thought that was kind of weird. Uh, they went into their room and saw everything decorated exactly the same, kind of matchy-matchy, like it was straight out of Bed Bath & Beyond, and they, they thought, well, this is strange, and they're wearing the same outfits, and they wondered if they were lesbians. Dora noticed this and began behaving seductively with frat boys to dispel the idea that she was a lesbian. She also told Amy never to wear the same thing she wore, not even a few days later. Now, Amy was going home on the weekends, um to her uh, family's home and not staying at college. In addition, her mother was coming up on Wednesdays to always do her laundry and spend a little bit of time with her. This is more of that dependence that she had on her parents. Eventually, Dora was really sick of this and uh, it, was, it was really cramping her style and um, preventing her from living the life she wanted. And so she asked for a room change. Amy cried and clung to Dora, clung to Dora and said, I will do anything. I will do all of your laundry. 
and um, I would do anything you want if you'll stay. But she wouldn't, and no one else was willing to room with her either. So after two weeks, she begged her parents if she could come home. And they did. They said yes. Now, at home, uh, the dad was spending all of his time in the garage or hanging out with Amy's brother. Her mother, who never got any of her husband's time, was thrilled to have Amy home. And they began to have sort of this codependent relationship. Her mother offered her safety and support and uh, didn't make her make any decisions again on her own. And there she was allowed to be as dependent as she wanted to be. People with this disorder have a difficult time making everyday decisions without an excessive amount of advice and reassurance from others. So um, a kid who's trying to pick out their classes for college should probably consult uh, with an advisor and maybe a parent, but they should be able to make the decision on their own without uh, somebody else having to make it for them. There's an example. Um, they need others to assume responsibility for most major areas of their life. So we saw with Amy that she would, um, uh, she didn't choose her own major. She didn't choose her own college. She didn't choose any of that. She just did whatever Dora was doing. They have difficulty expressing disagreement because they fear loss of support. Now the borderline personality doesn't know what they like and what they don't. Uh, the person with dependent personality does know, but they're not willing to say so because they're afraid that, that that will make the person not like them. So Amy might very well have preferred a different uh, set of um, uh, bedding. She probably didn't know what to major in, but she might have preferred a different set of bedding, but she would never say that to Dora. They have difficulty initiating projects and doing things on their own because of lack of confidence. They go to excessive lengths to obtain nurturance and support to the point of doing unpleasant things. So Amy might say, Dora, I'll do all of your laundry um, and clean the whole room all the time and even do your homework if you will remain my roommate. Or somebody might say, um, I'll do all the grunt work at work and you won't have to do it if you'll just be my friend. Um, they are uncomfortable or helpless when they're alone because they're terrified that they can't take care of themselves. What this does is it urgently, it causes them to urgently seek relationships with others other people who will take care of them and support them. So when Amy was faced with the idea of not being with her mother, she put all of her efforts into the relationship with Dora. And when Dora left her, she was unable to form a new friendship. And so she went back home. They're unrealistically preoccupied with fears of being left to take care of themselves. How does this happen? Well, of course, we're born dependent on other people. We are utterly helpless when we're born and we have to be socialized to take care of ourselves appropriately. Um, you know, when a child is two, you should say to them, would you like to wear the blue shirt or the red shirt? You don't say, what would you like to wear today? Because that's overwhelming, but you say blue shirt or red shirt. When they're uh, five, um, maybe you say, uh, would you like peanut butter and jelly or um, a turkey sandwich for lunch? When they're in third grade, they should probably be doing homework by themselves independently. When they're 10 to 12 years of age, they should start doing some of their own laundry. And by the time they're 16 or so, they should be making a lot of decisions on their own, including about their coursework. Now this varies by culture. Uh, there are some cultures in which um, it's more appropriate for women to be very dependent on men. And, and so in that case, we wouldn't diagnose uh, a disorder. Um, my, most likely uh, this is a person who was born with a difficult temperament. They're sensitive, they're fearful, they're dysregulated. Um, they don't like change. Uh, hypersensitive and hyperfearful. And then you combine that with parenting that is either overprotective or authoritarian. Let's talk about th overprotective parenting. Uh, this is something that um, irks me to death, I have to say, uh, because it's something that started to develop in the 1980s uh, when people started to put, um, in a well-meaning attempt to help uh, kids who had been abducted, they started to put uh, abducted kids' faces on uh, milk cartons. So I grew up with this at breakfast table. There's the carton of milk and a picture of, an, of a, an abducted kid. You know what that did to the parents and kids? Made us really fearful. It made us overestimate the likelihood of abduction. Um, at the same time, uh, there started to be more and more pressure to go to college. And so parents were investing heavily in their children and they started to become more overprotective and heavily invested just in order to prepare them for college. So overprotective parenting sends a message to a child 
that they are helpless and others are strong, that they can't do it, but others can, that they are delicate little creatures that need um, to be watched over and taken care of. Authoritarian parenting, on the other hand, is also uh, related to dependent uh, personality disorder. Authoritarian parenting is uh, parenting that is very low in warmth and very high in control. They don't hug and kiss and say, I love you and you're so awesome and look how pretty you are today. They say very little other than maybe do as I say or because I said so. They're very strict. They lay down the law, um, overly strict. So instead of a, a 10 p.m. curfew on the weekend, it's you don't get to go out at all. Um, instead of you're grounded for a week, it's you're grounded for three months. They're excessively strict. This kind of parenting um, makes kids feel weak. It makes them feel like they don't have any autonomy and that they're very weak and that others are strong. So both overprotective and authoritarian parenting teaches children that they're helpless and others are strong, that they lack autonomy and have to look to others. Parental inability to properly, <coughs> excuse me, raise children to take care of themselves is a factor here. The patients may seem like ideal patients, but the therapist has to be careful that the patient doesn't become dependent on them. Oh, Michael Scott, dependent personality disorder. He needs excessive reassurance about everything. He will harm himself to get his needs met. There's an episode where um, he's living with Jan. Jan has moved into his condo with him and uh, they're giving a, a tour of the house uh, to, um, to some of the, their coworkers from the office and it becomes clear that Jan sleeps in the king size bed by herself and Michael sleeps on an ottoman at the foot of the bed. He can't fit on that. Um, and he says, no, it's fine. It's, it's really, really good for my back. Well, clearly this is terrible. He's harming himself because he's so dependent on her. He's terrified of losing her, even though she's horribly abusive to him. I would say she has narcissistic personality disorder. Um, they are deeply uncomfortable being alone, um, urgently seek relationships. We see this with Michael over and over. Somebody breaks up with him. He's immediately going out and trying to find somebody else. He's always calling people and saying, hey, come hang out with me. He's preoccupied with fears of being alone. Of course, this makes him um, a lovable character, but in real life, uh, dependent personality disorder would not be quite so lovable. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder is, again, cluster C, anxious and fearful. Uh, I want you to be careful not to confuse this too much with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and I, I think I forgot to mention in one of the previous lectures, um, antisocial personality disorder is also one of those where you got to be careful with the name. It's not what it sounds like. Antisocial personality sounds like they don't want to be around other people. That's actually not true. They're often antisocial personality disorder. People are often very, very charming and they're good at charming other people and they are around other people a lot because they want to hurt people. So they're not antisocial in the sense that they um, are not wanting to be with people. That's more like asocial. They're antisocial in that they wanna hurt other people. Obsessive compulsive diso personality disorder also has to be distinguished from obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD is obsessions and compulsions. So obsessions with germs result in compulsions to wash hands for hours a day. Obsessions with symmetry results in organizing things for hours a day. Um, and there's this fear that if uh, they don't do the compulsion, then uh, something really catastrophic is gonna happen. With obsessive compulsive personality disorder, um, it's different than that. This is a, here's what I want you to focus on, orderliness, perfection, and control. They're very, very rigid and controlling. Everything has to be perfect and in order. Uh, their basic core belief is people should do better and try harder, including themselves. John wakes up to classical music at 5.45 a.m. every day. He prepares two eggs and toast and showers while the coffee maker runs. After a shower, he puts on his robe at the exact time the coffee maker beeps that it's done. He first checks the peephole, unlocks several dead boats, bolts in a very precise order, and then retrieves the paper to read while he has breakfast. He takes the bus to work every day. A car is a waste of money to him. Better to save that money uh, in case there's a catastrophe sometime down the road. He makes sure he arrives prior to 8 a.m., despite the fact that he doesn't punch a clock and is disgruntled if the bus is one minute late and makes that disgruntlement known to the bus driver. In fact, he started taking an earlier bus because the idea of being late to work is appalling to him. 
He disapproves of his co-workers who arrive past eight and chat over coffee, not settling down to work until 8.30. Where he sits down to his desk, um, his pencils are all, sh are all sharpened to the same length. He has many, many lists and file folders and emails to read. He's very productive at work. His work quality is excellent, except when he's working in a group. There, his perfectionism and rigidity drives others crazy. They end up letting him do all the work, and he does it because he'd rather it be right. Now, I will say here that for some people, the work might not be excellent. They might get so caught up in their lists and priorities and folders and organization and management system that they never actually get the work done. Um, John hasn't dated much. He can't find women who share his values. The few women he has dated have been put off by his rigidity and the semi-hoarding in his apartment to come back for more. John has no leisure activities. People with this disorder are preoccupied with details, rules, lists, order, organization, or schedules to the extent that oftentimes the major point of an activity is lost. John works as an accountant, and so um, his personality is, is pretty uh, well suited to his particular job in accounting, uh, but he would be lost if he were in finance where he needed to um, uh, be a bit more creative uh, with his uh, work. They show perfectionism that interferes with task completion. They're excessively devoted to work and productivity to the exclusion of leisure activities and friendship. So if John is in a group that has to do some work, of course, he doesn't want them to do it because he doesn't think they'll do it to his standards. And they don't want to work with him because he's so rigid and inflexible. And so they let him do it. And so he stays overnight and all weekend long getting the project done, which means, of course, he has no time for leisure activities and friendships. But that's just fine with him because he's so devoted to work. These people are overly conscientious, overly scrupulous. They're very inflexible about matters of morality, ethics, or values. So somebody who is one minute late, he sees them as stealing from the company, stealing time. Somebody who um, accidentally takes a, a pen home from work and, and keeps it at home is stealing. Uh, it's a matter of morality and ethics that they hold to an exceptionally high standard. Um, these people are unable to discard worn out or worthless objects, even when they have no sentimental value. So despite the fact that they like order and some areas of their home may be very, very orderly, they may have a lot of junk in the home uh, where they can't throw it out that almost starts to look like hoarding. They're reluctant to delegate tasks because they want uh, things done their particular way. They have a miserly spending habit towards self and others. Money is something to be hoarded because you never know when something terrible might happen in the future and they would need uh, that money. Uh, you also see the rigidity and the stubbornness. There is a genetic contribution uh, for this disorder. Um, parenting, though, is gonna have to reinforce the predisposition. Uh, oftentimes, people with this disorder have a dominant family member who also has it. Males are diagnosed at a rate twice that of females. Their rigidity and inflexibility does tend to make therapy not particularly effective. Uh, when they're in therapy, they focus on relaxation and cognitive reappraisal. Therapy will also target the fears that underlie the need for orderliness. Remember with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, people engage in compulsions to deal with their obsessions. So uh, they may have a symmetry um, obsession and so the compulsion is that everything has to be just so. That's a little bit like this. And of course, the person with OCD is afraid that something catastrophic will happen if they don't engage in the compulsion. And that's also the case here with a person with obsessive compulsive personality disorder. They're afraid something bad will happen if they uh, don't do their um, orderly routine. Um, the literature does find that serial killers often have this particular personality disorder. I had turned on Criminal Minds the other night and um, saw exactly this, <laughs> exactly this. Um, uh, clearly this, uh, it was showing uh, a little vignette. This guy was clearly going to be the serial killer. He obviously had some women in his basement tied up and screaming and crying. And he's very neat and orderly and he's making his bed just so with like hospital corners and um, he's very, very buttoned up in his dress. He's a white dress shirt on, neatly pressed uh, khaki pants, a tie. He walks very slowly throughout his room, going about his morning, getting his breakfast, um, and uh, um, being very, very rigid about everything. 
and you could just see the OCD personality, um, uh, the OC personality written all over him. And uh, it is true that uh, serial killing and this seem to go hand in hand. Who is um, our office uh, compatriot uh, who has obsessive compulsive personality disorder? I'm going to say that's Angela Martin. She is a perfectionist, a workaholic. She's extremely moralistic, and she is rigid and stubborn. And we see this over and over in the office uh, to great hilarity. All right, that's uh, the end of this chapter. Hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time.